Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 791. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is February 28th, 2022. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted, 791 of them. Some of you, I think three three or 400, have watched us from the beginning, and I really, really appreciate that because I've watched them all too. I have to edit the show after we record it, and I just, you guys have stuck around. We appreciate it. Some of you have left for better fields, some better podcasts somewhere. That's fine. We're okay with that. Some of you are new joining us since we reported a little bit on the uh, Asbury Revival, and we appreciate you for joining us. George, how are you doing this week? Well, right now in the background, you may be able to hear machines running that the men's group are cleaning the maple syrup off the floor <laughs> from Shrove Tuesday last night. And somebody came and dropped one of these off on my desk, <laughs> no. little little beads that the kids were given on, out on Tuesday. Busy time, Ash Wednesday, the start mm-hmm. of Stations of the Cross. We had a big conference this week at the church where we talked about major depressive disorder and prayer. Um, six hour presentations. I gave two one hour lectures, not lectures, but talks. Talks, sure. And then at the end of the month, so that means we've got four, I had, I did six Eucharists this weekend, uh, plus two classes. So I still am in zombie land. And to top it off, my mother-in-law had a stroke and we had, oh. and my wife had to fly up uh, mer- uh, for emergency visit. Mother-in-law's 91. She's the last of our grand, uh, the children's grandparents. My parents have passed. Susan's father, stepfather passed away. And it's always a shock. F- and uh, it's a terrible time for Susan. And I'm not too happy about it myself. But we just pray that God's will be unfolding quickly for Susan's mother's and her life. Sure. Uh, Jill went up to Connecticut. from. She flew from... 82 degree all sunny florida into connecticut where it's been snowing last night so i've been getting uh, angry texts but she had to go for work so there's not much she could do about it so uh there is one other thing kevin yes that i need to announce <laughs> oh good i just paid this morning the last of my student loan payments oh my gosh i'm oh. clear how many I'm years done. is that i'm wow. out <laughs> 30 years i think close on 30 years uh-huh. no no that's an exaggeration i graduated in 95 uh-huh. so what's that 20 that's so close 25 years, years. <laughs> 28 years it's <laughs> amazing so, so i'm free kevin i'm free i cannot get a credit card i can now buy a car or buy <laughs> okay. a house so how many uh higher education institutes did you go to you went to um, yeah, I remember you went over to some place over in uh, London, not London, over in uh, uh, England. Where, where'd you all go? Remember, I had two careers. I had a BA and an MBA from Duke. Mm-hmm. I went to the Wharton School for for uh, a master's degree. Then I got religion, and I started off at Villanova University while I was going through the process, then went mm-hmm. to Yale, and then went to Oxford Universities. So. <sighs> What's that? Uh, Duke, Duke, Penn, Villanova, Oxford, Yale. It's five. Five. And That's I don't crazy. give money to any of those places <laughs> when alumni letters go. Oh, brother. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's a lot of education, a lot of travel. Hey, some, no, no, no. Some people, some people buy boats, some people drink, they have girlfriends. Mm-hmm. I accumulate credits. So I don't know. <laughs> from well, some people get know. an MBA. An MBA would teach you not to take out credit on a loan. And then you take one of the, the poorest professions in the world, uh, becoming a priest. So, yeah. Oh, but we doubled down by being journalists. Of course, that's what yes. the big money is. <laughs> Uh, all right so we should move on to the news more follow-up from the church of england's llf living love and faith decision um lots happening uh, it's it's global it's made all the papers even a certain evil dictator has uh, chimed in on it i find the most interesting news this week Catherine the, jeffrey shorey i did I, nah, I no 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 higher yeah higher higher somebody higher. else higher higher, higher. higher. okay 
has chimed in on it. But uh, let's talk about the release of the votes. Who voted for what uh, in the rank of the bishops has been released? Uh, who supported the LLF decision? Who didn't, George? It's interesting. Not all suffragans vote. Uh, only mm. some suffragans have a vote in the House of Bishops and Synod. And there were four votes against and two abstentions. Uh, diocesan Bishop Christopher Coxworth, who was on the Bishop of Coventry, who was on the LLF committee, abstained, which I thought was very telling, as did Philip North, who's the new bishop. He had been a suffragan. He's an Anglo-Catholic. All the other Anglo-Catholic bishops voted for it. Those who voted against it were primarily uh, evangelical suffragans. Uh, Rick Thorpe of Islington in the Diocese of London, Jill Duff, the Bishop of Lan suffragan Bishop of Lancaster. Mm -hmm. So what were, and so bishops who were releasing letters saying they weren't keen on this, they didn't know, they weren't happy, like the Bishop of Carlisle, James Newsom, or uh, the Bishop of Leicester, Martin Snow, who are making noises that this isn't where we want to go, they still voted for it. And so what, and because the vote was so strong, with almost all, all but one of the diocesan and bishops voting for it, Coxworth abstained, it shows how powerful the lure of institutional unity is. Yes. The bishops basically sang, Wilby was singing from the song sheet, we must walk, walk together and do this together. And this vote is a vote for walking together. It's not the final word. And that's why Coxworth voted against it. Because well, he just, Coxworth... Coxworth wrote an article for the uh, Living Church in their Covenant blog um, saying he's this is what was supposed to happen. This is not where we want to be. Yeah. Coxworth, the mid, uh, Coxworth laid out in rather understated. Is in other words, you have to sort of think about what he just said because there are a lot of double negatives and uh, <laughs> qualifiers. But essentially, he said that the, uh, and I'll quote from it. I've got pulled it up. Well, just now, the bishops did not quote did not give the time and attention to hone the responses and scrutinize the prayer with the great care that was needed. So in other words, this was a rush job. The prayers were written and nobody thought through how they should come. And then he goes on to say that the theology and the legal questions that would be raised by all of this were not addressed. He's, uh, he's saying this is, see, this is the Episcopal Church's way, and this is how it's been round, roundly condemned throughout the communion and other uh, ecumenical institutions for years where they decide to do something, then they backdate their theological understanding. We started with a, with birth control in 1930 and with divorce and remarriage in 1948. And we just said, okay, we're going to do it. Now we're going to give us time to figure out why we can do this. Mm -hmm. The Church of England has always been rather huffy puffy and saying, well, we'd like to do all the hard work before we make the decisions. And Coxworth has admitted, we've decided not to do the hard work not to look at whether this is doctrine or practice. And so all the lies that will be, not lies, the exaggerations that this doesn't do any, change anything, Cox was just saying, we didn't even discuss this. No, it and wasn't. Another yeah. point. Go ahead. And, and another point that, uh, uh, well, he says, you know, we've done this in the wrong order. We haven't come up with theology. We've come up with prayers. And mm -hmm. in Anglicanism, we have a tradition of praying shapes believing. And if we're praying something, but we don't know why we're praying it or cannot say why we should. And Coxworth also basically says that uh, it became, a, I'll read a quote to you. It soon became clear that different bishops had, after all, different understandings of what was being provided. Anthony Pogo, the ACC Secretary General, wrote to all the primates and told the Anglican Consultative Council in Ghana, this changes nothing. The doctrine of the Church of England hasn't been changed. Then you have the Archbishop of York and the Bishop of London saying, this changes everything. Non-marital sexual relations can be blessed and can be good and can be holy. Those are completely different things but it's the same it's bishops reading the same document and getting the same getting those diametrically opposed answers 
So Coxworth is basically saying, and then he concludes by saying, and we just seem to be totally out of touch, not only with the Synod, but with the Anglican Communion. And I'll read his little line here. The proposed provision has united a broad alliance of evangelical networks and significant Catholic voices in suspicion, bewilderment, and consternation. Um, they've done a great job in uniting the traditionally fractious uh, conservative movements within world Anglicanism and in the Church of England because they're out of touch, totally well, out of touch. I would say, especially within the Church of England, we're hearing uh, of meetings where uh, clergy are addressing their bishops. And I think the most uh, spectacular one is to, to hear that the Bishop of London had to sit down with 200 of her clergy. And George, they were not happy. A meeting was scheduled where Sarah Mullally would ag agree to meet with unhappy clergy. And the location had to be changed three times to accommodate the number of clergy who said they were coming. And it was closed to the media. It was a closed session. And we people have been giving us notes and there are a number of people who blogged about the event. So we're pretty confident about what we report. Uh, Sarah Mullally was basically gobsmacked by the degree of hurt, anger, bewilderment. And it ran across party lines, tribal lines, group lines, even some liberals. First off, it was clear that everybody had lost tremendous faith and confidence in the bishops as an institution. The, the bishops had let down the side. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a celibate gay priest who was of an Anglo-Catholic nature who got up and said, you essentially are telling me that my sacrifices of my adult life have been in vain and are a joke. And that what I thought, what I had been taught and what I understand the Bible to say is sin that I have fought against in my own life, I was mistaken. And for him, that was destructive and devastating. A gay man saying the bishop's statements were destructive. We had evangelicals who were saying that, you know, the Bible just cannot stand with you. We cannot stand with you on this point. You are rejecting the clear, unambiguous words of scripture. We had charismatics uh, speak up. We had some Nigerian clergy working in the Church of England in London saying this is just totally abhorrent to the immigrant Anglican communities in your diocese. Uh, we had a uh, number of clergy saying they're going to have to vote with the money that they send. In England, uh, parishes have a parish share. In the United States, Episcopal Church is mandatory. You've got to cut 10% to the big guy. Uh, I don't think you've got more. Yeah, 10%. The there's, yeah. there's diocese with 15% and 20%, yeah. Well, in Florida, we give 10% to the big guy, 11% uh, next year. But uh, they don't have to do that. That's voluntary in the Church of England. And a number of so many per churches now have indicated to the diocese that they will be withholding their parish share and diverting it to things like a good stewards trust where the money will be used to support smaller uh, less uh, less well-off congregations that sarah malali after this meeting has to ha has called an emergency meeting of the diocese of london finance committee now london is the wealthiest diocese because of all this real estate all this inherited wealth trusts and property but when you're, you could lose up to three fifths of the parish share. Oh, easily. Because yeah. not every church, not every church gives the same amount. Uh, also, Langham Place, we're talking several hundred thousand pounds mm -hmm. are going to be pulled out of the diocesan uh, budget. Well, um, I saw St. Helen's Bishop Gate put out a statement as well. St. Helen's Bishop's Gate has uh, gone even farther. They've jumped into the Gafcon bed. And Foley Beach and Kanishka Raphael, the Bishop of Archbishop of Sydney, along with some other uh, GAFCON bishops, have uh, released videos stating they will support and offer alternative Episcopal oversight to uh, St. Helens Bishop's Gate. Now, Sarah Mullally has to decide, is she going to say, okay, that's fine, or is she going to fight? Um, we'll see how that turns out. But St. Helens Bishop's Gate and as Rector William Taylor have said, this is a line that the Church of England bishops have crossed that we cannot follow them with. Yeah. That we do not recognize in their action 
uh, the good news of Jesus Christ, which is a may they're calling Bishop Mullally a heretic. They're basically saying that she is she's a false teacher. That's a big step. A number of uh, some people have told me that there's some ordinands in the diocese who have put off their ordination because they do not want to be ordained by a heretical bishop. Yeah. I think that's a mistake. I think you know ordination is not contingent upon the worthiness of the of the bishop, but still, it's a significant statement that these these people are not willing to go along and get along and just allow the the gay lobby to conquer all before them well here we see that the, the church of england brand has all but been destroyed the anglican communion largely doesn't recognize it anymore um you know th there's not much holding it together except for that the priests who re and bishops who remain who think this is the right course and we have to see how that that works well let's let's do the sherlock holmes test the dog in the night which dog is barking, barking in the night yeah. the evangelicals the anglo-catholics gafcon the globe in the church of england there's significant barking outside the church of england the anglo the gafcon the global south are voicing vociferous objections even i haven't come across even darth vader i mean putin has chimed in on this george oh yes in his address to the nation, Vladimir Putin raised the Church of England as an example of the moral decline of the West. And though I probably disagreed with 90% of his speech, I could say, well, that, you know, yeah, Vlad, that... you've, got, you, you've sure. got a good example there. Uh -huh. He was specifically talking about uh, the Church of England making uh, the Lord gender neutral. So uh, our, not father, not mother in heaven, our what in heaven, yeah. our our um, non-binary god above yes yeah mm -hmm. well so food picked up but i haven't seen statements from the episcopal church or the or i've seen individual bishops have been making statement the former primate of brazil francisco assis de silva said this is wonderful he's pro-gay julio martin the bishop of southeastern mexico he's uh, supports the gay agenda yeah, sure uh the primate linda nichols of canada says oh this is great but the concerted outpouring of support that welby may have been hoping to receive from maybe the scots and the welsh and uh other places it's not materialized i didn't check too closely because i don't follow him did michael curry say anything no I don't not that I'm yet. aware of. No. Now uh, um, there is a there is a, a retreat coming up for the bishops of the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. They may say something there. I don't know, but Kevin, oh, I'm, uh, a a retreat statement basically done just as everybody else is packing to get out of town. That's how it happens. doesn't have the weight of a global South statement or a or a Gafcon statement or a, you know. William Taylor at St. Helens Bishopgate statement. The mm -hmm. responses are uneven to the extreme. And even, you know, members of the progressive groups in the Church of England, they're not happy because they see this as a as a false uh, solution. They wanted they wanted more and they're not getting more. They still feel second class and they are not satisfied till they get everything that they want. So the Archbishop of Unity has caused disunity at every level. Not, not surprised. However, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury did take time to pen his thoughts about the uh, Ukraine-Russia war. And uh, uh, we can certainly talk about that because he, his ultimate thought is, I don't want, uh, when Russia loses, our response to turn them into Germany and of World War One. And yeah, I, I can see that, but... I, for a peacemaking, well, my, uh, go ahead. He's, he released a statement on the first anniversary of the war, the, the beginning of the current phase of the war. And he made some unequivocal statements that Russia's invasion is immoral, illegal, has no foundation whatsoever. 
the clarity with which Justin Welby should be addressing the issues within the Church of England, he's using to address the war in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And in, but within the Church of England, he's all ambiguity. Well, he, they think and we think, and therefore I need to be above it all. Um, the Russians invaded the Ukraine, invoking an article uh, under the United Nations uh, where they felt that they were justified in taking offensive action based upon the deaths of 16,000 Russian, ethnic Russians in the Donbass and the breakaway regions, based upon their violation of the Minsk agreements where Ukraine would not be weaponized against Russia, all this and that. You can read Russia's defense. Whether you believe it or not is immaterial, but the Russians believe that they are fully justified. And the degree of ambiguity, Justin Welby wants to bring to international relations the degree of uh, of no questions, no subtlety, no understanding um, that is rather foolish because, you know, the Ukraine is in the midst of losing this war. Um, it's over, it's done. We get all these blowhards saying, oh, we'll send them F-16s. Well, it takes a pilot about a year or two to learn how to fly an F-16 and, you know, all of this stuff. It's, it's, it, the war is over for all intents and purposes and by us sending more munitions, we're just prolonging the death of Ukrainian citizens. And, in, and by June anyway, all of the 55 millimeter ammunition that NATO has stored up for years will be gone. And we're expen we've used up seven years worth of Stinger missiles already, or Sidewinders and Stingers and whatnot. So we're gonna run out of ammunition at a certain point and then it'll be over, over. And prolonging the war just kills more people. More people died in that last year of the Second World War in Germany and Poland and whatnot than in the beginning. So uh, I just wish Justin would bring this degree of moral certainty he has to moral questions and, and not jump in headlong into politics where he doesn't have that degree of uh, knowledge. Yeah, I, for me, I thought, you know, for Justin Ryan's statement, it was an okay statement. You know, I, I, he's certainly done worse. But when it gets to theology and doctrine, not good. When it gets to politics and uh, uh, office see, administration, he's saying, it's pretty good. When the war, when the war is over, we shouldn't have a Versailles-type treaty that strips Russia of property, land, territory, its army, military. And the thing is, it's the Ukraine who he should be talking about when the war is over, they shouldn't strip it of property, land, this and that and the other. There is no way Russia is losing this war. No way whatsoever. Um, unless we decide to push the button and send a, and make it a nuclear war. All right, more news out there. Oh, we covered this in before the election. Tanzania has held its election and the GAFCON candidate, who is probably the most pro-gay candidate, lost, George. Stanley Hote lost to I mean, the current archbishop who was seeking a second five-year term. Tanzania is a funny place. Uh, only in Tanzania can the BAF, GAFCON back candidate be the one that is considered the pro-gay candidate. Stanley Hote invited a group from Christ Church in Greenwich, Connecticut, very wealthy church, very liberal, to his diocese of Mount Kilimanjaro, and uh, money was given out to help the poor and the needy, which was used by Stanley, according to the Tanzanian newspapers, mm -hmm. to bribe voters to support him for election to archbishop. So the bishop election was held, and it was very close. I think it was like 72 to 65 or 67 among the delegates. So Emmendola won. Now, what does this mean for the long run? Well, Emmendola is not going to uh, Mendola is not going to be jumping into the Gafcon bed because his opponent was waving the Gafcon flag, but nor is he jumping into the Welby bed. Mendola is doing a George Conger. Now, what does that mean? He basically at the Lambeth conference he gave a speech saying, "You white people with your problems in the global north, don't bring them to Tanzania. Leave us alone." Uh, and we're fine, thank you. Stay as far away as possible. We're happy being Anglicans. We're not going to get involved in your fights. 
which is sort of what I'm doing at my little parish in Florida. Uh, we're happy. Down. We're successful. Keep our head down. Mm -hmm. Don't bring your problems down here. So doesn't mean he's a vote for Welby. He just doesn't want to play either game because nobody's on his side. Um, everybody seems to be raided against him, he feels. <laughs> All right, let's go on to some other news here. Uh, we've talked about Bernard Randall in a couple episodes ago. He's the, uh, uh, is he from Ireland? No, no, uh, that's What's it from? Enoch Burke. Yeah, that's Enoch, Enoch Burke, Burke is, the, yeah, yeah. is the teacher in Northern in Ireland. That's right. right. Bernard Randall was the chaplain, chaplain at a Church yep. of England uh, private school, boarding school. I should have wrote that in my was, notes. I did not. But he uh, had an employee, he was... Uh, he was a chaplain who gave a biblical, traditional, reasoned speech on why uh, students should not automatically accept the uh, LGTB culture they're being told about, George. He had the goal to say you should think for yourself. Uh, and for that, he was essentially fired. Mm -hmm. and, lit and then the college reported him, so they call what we would call private schools, colleges in England, yeah. uh, for some reason. And the college reported him to the government as a terrorist risk for uh, a safeguarding risk for seeking to uh, turn uh, the children into little zealots, as if he was some Muslim preacher calling for holy war and jihad. And Libby Lane, the bishop of, of Derby, his diocese, Spelled Derby, we say it Derby in the UK, mm -hmm. in England, America, Dar Derby in England. Bishop of Derby basically refused to support him, refused to help him. He's upholding the doctrine and discipline of the Church of England. And Libby Lane, the bishop, colluded with reporting him as a safeguarding risk for rad supposedly radicalizing children by teaching them the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, he had a tribunal hearing the 23rd and 24th of February, employment tribunal hearing, and he lost. And the judge wrote an opinion that was so awful that it will probably be overturned because the woman, the judge, the employment tribunal officer who was ruling on unfair dismissal, essentially said, well, you could have always quit, and how could you be even against the woke agenda? So he was, he was railroaded, and it's going to go to appeal. But the deeper question is, if the Church of England is bishops are not willing to support their clergy for doing what the Church of England said, this is not Bernard Randall saying if you don't, if you sleep with another man or another woman of this, if you sleep with someone of the same sex, you're going to hell. It's not something like that. He's yeah. just saying, here are the different views. This is traditional church view. This is what you hear in the world. Mm -hmm. You decide. I myself believe X, but it, you are an intelligent adult, and I urge you to follow your conscience and book. If the Church of England is not even willing to do that, God help those who, within the fight now that we've got bishops going totally cuckoo, that they think they can trust the bishops or that the bishops have their best interests at heart. The answer is absolutely not. And Bernard Randall, who's 50 years old, finds himself as unemployable. Who's going to hire him? Because he's got a, uh, you know, as a teacher, he's got a mark on him that he's a safeguarding risk, as if he were a pervert. Yep. And he can't get a parish because he can't get a recommendation from his bishop. He's in limbo land. A long time ago, not too long ago, you would go to school, whether it be K through 12 or college, to adopt critical thinking skills, George. The ability to reason and discern. And we've, you know, when I got to college, the big thing was question authority. You know, a question with what the teachers are telling you, for one thing. And we don't do that anymore. We are we are living now in a in a true Borg mentality that woke has introduced us to and is now uh, oppressing us to keep, George. We have to stay woke, um, whether we like it or not. And, you know, Bernard is a victim of this. You and I are victims of this. And uh, it's ruined journalism. Journalism is gone forever. It certainly ruined the Church of England. Uh, and here at the Episcopal Church, it's sad to watch. But long time ago, it was yes, a I little different. Yeah. 
I agree, but I, I agree with that, but I disagree. Okay. I, I have been victimized, but I don't consider myself a victim. No, we, far we, from it. I'm, yeah. I'm, ha I'm, I'm happy with my life. Um, you know, if we had a different culture, I would it would have taken a different course. But I believe that God has planted me here for a reason and a purpose, and I don't feel victimized. I don't feel oppressed. Uh, I, frankly, couldn't care less what some of these kooks and nuts think. You know, because I got God on my side Amen. and the Star Spangled Banner. Okay, well, let's talk about a different victim then. Uh, Bishop elect Charlie Holt. Uh, there's still more percolating liberals who are very disgusted that he was even on the, the candidate sheet. And we're learning more that they're, they're pushing harder and harder to make sure he does not get to be uh, consecrated to Bishop George. It's the mask has fallen from the opponent's face who are saying that the system was unfair. The, uh, Holt was elected on the third ballot, the first election. He was elected on the first ballot, the second election. And each time procedural objections were raised and the objections were upheld the first time around on technical grounds that not enough notice was given. But this the, the Episcopal Church uh, Tribunal ruled that all the procedures were properly followed. But then they went off their mandate to say, but the culture of the Diocese of Florida of not welcoming non-celibate gay clergy means that if there were different voters, there would have been a different outcome. So, and that's unfair. So let's just pause for a sec. And now this, now a letter has been released by gay activists and clergy to all the bishops saying, don't vote for Charlie Holt because Florida is unfair to gays. So here, here, here's what they're saying. We need to change the voters to get the outcome that we want. <laughs> Sam Howard has will not license non-celibate gay clergy. They are gay clergy, but they must ask yeah. be main be, celibate. Yeah. People going through the ordination process, they you know they will basically not make it through. And retired clergy who move there who happen to be gay and partnered will not be licensed. They'll have to stay as clergy in New York or Chicago or whatever it is. And it is claimed that if we only had more gay clergy and if we had gay retirees who are allowed to vote who have no connection to the diocese other than having moved there in retirement, well, then we would have had a different outcome. And therefore, because there's a possibility there was a different outcome because they didn't do it our way, you should vote against Charlie Hope. Now, this hasn't happened yet. The bishops still have to vote, but it will be the whether the bishops oft repeated state that the, the wars are over, we're going to live and let live, that conservatives have a valued place in our hearts and all of this and that, whether it's a total lie or not. Um, I hope it's not. Uh, well, uh, I, but I, I think, you know, the, the, they have no choice but to sink him because they've been listening to the gay tech lobby for so long uh why change now you know they they threw out the first election of mark lawrence with no problem uh you know so i i i see this going bad because it's it's florida is the ground they want you know this is where uh people are retiring to this is where people are moving to in droves uh they're not fighting for a california church because they don't need to but they could certainly fight well, for a florida diocese well, it's like the difference between um, Fort Worth and Dallas. Dallas uh, when, when all these troubles began. Fort Worth maybe had three, four clergy who were suspect. Dallas maybe had about 10%. And, that t and Fort Worth basically had to be treated as a block because they couldn't s suborn it from within. Right. Florida has about 10% clergy who support the gay agenda and therefore and they have gotten big enough to try to wreck the rest of the thing central florida doesn't have a block that big we're like akin to fort worth in the sense of being fairly consistently across the board uh a certain cast of mind um so the fight you're right kevin the fight really has to be florida because then they can shade their lies by coming up with these false statements it was a fixed system and this and that whereas if it were in florida 
you know, Central Florida, you know, the system was clear, straightforward, and the outcome, and none of the candidates were for what they want. Um, we did elect the most uh, problematic one for the national church. And it was sort of, actually, if you think about it, the, stand, the search committee was pretty clever. The most conservative was also the only Hispanic running. So that would have given them pause, the national church pause to torpedo a Hispanic in Florida, who happened to be the most conservative, whereas Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, same old, same old was the one who was elected. Yeah. Don't know. That's, that's the trouble with uh, 2023 Christianity. It's no longer about glorifying God. Uh, that that's out. Let's move on to some more news, George. And we've run out of Christian news, and we've run out of Anglican news. Oh, we have, we have I have one more. I just noticed in the corner of my eye. Uh oh, what you got? Uh, this it's is actually, not on the list. Think, it's not on the list. Yeah, it's not on the list. Uh, the cathedral in Leicester, England. Uh, David Monteith, who's now the new dean of Canterbury, the partner oh, gay that. man, was okay. moved from from Leicester to Canterbury, and they've now got a new dean or an interim dean in place and they put out at canterbury leicester cathedral put out this we have an all-woman staff it's a victory for diversity and inclusion and they print a picture and there are five or six women in their late 50s early 60s all white all rather dumpy and this is a sign of inclusivity okay there are no men there are no blacks, They're, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and the bishop, Martin Snow, in the background. Uh, here, you know, you talk about inclusivity. This looks like a meeting of the mothers, uh, the the mothers union. If somebody uh, said coven, coven, middle class, know. middle <laughs> mid, middle class, middle aged, yeah. late middle aged women, and this is a victory for diversity. I, I, there's no Muslims there. There's no. I mean, I don't know what the. <laughs> Nobody's in a wheelchair, Kevin. No, a wheelchair. No, no vets, no nothing. Yeah, I mean, uh, what the Church of England and certainly the Episcopal Church think of is diverse is not diverse at all. And, uh, you know, I was going to move on to another story. Well, let's see here. I Oh, yeah, so we have no more Christian. Is there an update on Asbury? If I could put that in the title again, we can raise our viewership. No news from Asbury. No news. They they're still going on. They haven't canceled. It's still they going. It's still going. It's okay. still going on. Uh, yeah. They've basically tried to move it off campus because college has got to teach and sure, yeah, yeah. life goes on. Hmm. But it doesn't seem to be dying out. Okay, cool. Our, in fact, I saw Ryan Danker put out an article on it. I didn't get a chance to read it, so I'll have to read that after the show. Maybe I'll put it. If it's a good article, I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, here's the biggest news of the last, uh, since COVID existed. Uh, the Biden administration, through the Department of Energy, says, okay, it was the lab in Wuhan. What? <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, I saw that and, you know, I'm like, obviously it's a false story. Somebody at CNN or Washington Post or something is making it up. And I researched the story. No, the Department of Energy did put out a press release saying uh, in our final analysis, this was an outbreak, not on purpose, from the Wuhan lab. And now we're going to find out in five years it was on purpose. But uh, there is a reason there's conspiracy theories, George. And one of the reasons is the governments lie. They're not transparent. Uh, and they will fight you for trying to tell the truth. To, to think that the American government would ban people, criticize people, uh, threaten to uh, cancel people because they had a different opinion based on evidence they saw, it, it, it's... It's mind blowing. It's absolutely mind blowing that now we learn, thankfully, the Biden administration has decided that we are okay to learn that Fauci lied, that major scientists around the world has lied. The World Health Organization lied for a while, but uh, I think they changed their tune 
to we don't know about six months ago so th they're trying to get away safe on this but everybody lied everybody that's crazy George. it's you know people careers were destroyed uh, mm -hmm. what the department of energy released yesterday twitter under the, the pre-elon musk era and facebook what a band i don't know if those would have banned it and and banned you for repeating disinformation and the thing is the uh, what's F fauci i forget his first name um peter philip doctor something. doctor yeah D doctor <laughs> fauci knew that it was a lie and was behind spreading the lie now his reasons have not been made clear but testimony before congress has shown that he personally authorized the money to be sent to be used by this Chinese lab. The money trail follows with him that he edited the article in science. Uh, he was not the author, but he was the editor of the article in science magazine that's just, that said it could not be a lab leak. It had to come from this wet market in uh, Wuhan. In other words, he, from the very beginning, promulgated untruths such as the vet, that uh, you needed to have these vaccines that immunity won't do you any good natural immunity that, won't he do knew you. that to yeah. be natural yeah. immunity and others if you had it you're not going to get it. he knew that to be untrue but he mm. kept pushing the vaccine out he knew that masks offered no real protection yet he was the nasty mandate nazi and he, he would wear two masks I mean, it, you mm -hmm. know, and the and the thing is that because the science was, he basically has the blood of tens of thousands of people on his hands because other scientists could not begin to look at combating this virus uh, and trying to explore how it occurred because they were going down a wrong, the false path of this natural rose naturally in the environment rather than an engineered bioweapon. And because of that, you know, science was perverted. Uh, it's uh, re research was perverted. Um, I don't watch Saturday Night Live. I haven't watched it in, gosh, no, how many years? 30 years, 20 years? St still me, is uh, Chevy Chase still on that? And Dan Ackley? Yeah, I wish. Uh, <laughs> Belushi's dead. The, uh, I, uh, last time but, I watched uh, it, Belushi was alive. Yeah. Yeah. Woody Harrelson, I was the I saw a clip on the social media where Woody Harrelson was the guest host, mm -hmm. and he said, "Wouldn't it be a tremendous screenplay if all the?" And he basically t told all the stuff that we now know to be true. He said, "Nah, nobody believe it. It's be too far fetched, too nonsense." And Woody Harrelson, who is a very liberal, politically liberal actor. Uh, uh, more libertarian than liberal, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's against. He's, he's a vegan. Big, big government, yeah, big yeah. business. Yeah, he, he's yeah. into all that stuff. Yeah. He, uh, when Woody Harrelson is making more sense than our government leaders, we know this. We know the just as the bishops of the Church of England have lost, have lost the confidence and trust of their clergy. So have the elected elites of this country and the unelected elites lost the trust of the people in this country. Who's going to believe them? Well, hold on. No, but th George, there's the problem. People will always believe the government. I, I live in a very conservative community. And even here, there's people who think the government would never lie. Why would they lead us astray? Why would they not tell us the truth? I am from, I was raised by Minnesota Democrats. My whole family, other than me, is a Minnesota Democrat. They believe the government would never lie unless there was a Republican in charge of it. And so th there's this built-in, since infancy, uh, structure that they teach you K through 12, that the government is here to help, which Ronald Reagan would say is the most dangerous word you ever hear. Um, and uh, they, they teach this, especially here in America, that... Uh, our past is evil, but the government here now is here to help. And it, it, it's hard to watch. It's it's destructive to our society. And our society will fall based on what we teach our kids 
for sure. Hmm. Well, I don't. And he, yeah. he, here's a here's a funny here's a funny thing that all this stuff seems to be coming out of the woodwork. Um, a, a few news people reported recently that uh, the reason why Nixon was impeached was the same deep state that got rid of Trump because Nixon started looking into the JFK assassination. And and the uh, CIA and the FBI had to get rid of Nixon. And so they basically... Well, yeah, I, I think... And that Bob would, he, but here's the thing, Kevin. If you and I heard this a year or two ago, we go, that's nuts. But well, yeah. nowadays, and where we know the media don't tell us the truth, we know that... You know, the FBI, Twitter was a division of the FBI, and Facebook is still a division. Uh, YouTube is still a division of the FBI and the CIA in their propaganda arms. Things we just knew because we were cognizant adults and we read the papers and listened to things. We now know, as regards to COVID, as regards to so many other things, to be lies. So, what else was a lie? I'm not saying Nixon thing is true. Not, no, 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 I, yeah. well, I mean, we know through Deep Throat that that's probably not true, but it's a, it's an interesting theory um, now that we re revealed who Deep Throat was. And Deep, Deep Throat was an FBI senior official. Yeah. Now, now we know who? through whistleblowers that the FBI is, right now is completely corrupt. Yeah I, yeah, I think it was corrupt from day one, but now it's, it's worse than ever, you know. Um, yeah, I mean. There was that story out of Richmond where the Richmond Bureau wrote uh, a memo, an analyst wrote a memo for agents in the Richmond Bureau saying beware of traditional Catholics because uh, future that they could be the next future terrorists. And mm. this Prevent Charity in Britain, which was set up to help with Islamic radicalization in schools and in the mm. communities, has been issuing, issuing warnings that uh, an unhealthy admiration of Winston Churchill or British history, or liking uh, the movie Zulu, or the Dam Busters, makes you a potential terrorist. I think, Kevin, probably all of our British audience would now be considered terrorists because they like the Dam Busters and Michael Caine and Zulu. Uh, this is how crazy this world has gotten. It, it has become crazy, and it's been run by, it's currently being run and listened to by a radical minority. And, you know, this radical minority uh, gets the headlines in the papers and has the influence in the schools. Uh, they influence our hospitals now. We, we have uh, CRT, critical race theory, and wokeism uh, being taught to our future doctors. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's sad to watch. You and I will certainly have to report on it because uh, the Christian implications of wokeism uh, is our destruction. Uh, if wokeism continues to take hold. Now, I have good news for you. Here in America, several states are finally banning drag queen performances for kindergartens and middle school kids. I don't know why it took so damn long, but there, there's some good news. It, it, it's finally happening. You know? But Kevin, here's the thing. What, it's one thing, that, that addresses the drag queen side of the thing. What about the parents who bring their children to these things? Yeah. How sick are these parents? Now, mm -hmm. a pervert's going to be a pervert. It's going to be a pervert. Yeah, and you should prevent them from being in a position where they can take a, take a, take advantage of the situation. But if a parent bringing a five, six, seven-year-old to see men make sexual gyrations on stage and make obscene jokes and lewd mm -hmm. gestures... That's something really sick in this world, where parents are bringing their kids into this. <sighs> Let's go. Hey, you want to go through some of the comments? Sure. What do you got? That I don't know. I just uh, let's let's just read a couple here. The and guys, I'm just you know, uh, these are fun to do. Uh, let's see. We'll go here to the top. Uh, I'm trying to understand the new event in the church. I should say, Kevin Carlson, that you seem to be as heartbroken uh, as I uh, to what's been happening. I should also reflect back on uh, George Conger, that you appear to be happy with the storm that has broken out. 
Hmm. And he's, he's clearly refer referring to the uh, uh, LLF and the COE. Are you happy, George? Well, I am a naturally sanguine, optimistic, uh, upbeat sort of guy. Yeah. I get up every morning and I sing, good morning, star shine. And I go look at the birds and I <laughs> smile. No, Say I'm not Levy, happy. Say Levy, Levy. Yeah. But I'm not surprised. I'm not disappointed because I expect evil. Uh, Satan is a lion prowl. Expect evil is the Bible tells us, mm -hmm. but know that the victory of the good is certain. So yeah, there's this a... is in line with how God says the world is going to be. We will see evil. We will see false teachers. We will see corruption. Maybe we're just that much closer to the turn of Christ. Yeah, and I, I'm a big, per, a big picture guy. Uh, when I see what happens in Church of England or the Episcopal Church, uh, or other places that are teaching, you know, uh, mainline heresy now, uh, and have lost the sight of the good news of Jesus Christ. It hurts deep, deep inside. But I'm also a big picture guy because I know I, I read the end of the book. I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen for me and my family. I know what's going to happen for my uh, family and friends who are Christian. I know what's going to happen to the church that is uh, following. Uh, the gospel and I know exactly what's gonna happen to the church that's not following the gospel so Kevin sometimes you've got a smirk on your face and it just bothers me I because I'm looking back and I'm seeing the big picture you know my, my face is not showing the pathos that I, I always feel it, it is what it is you know well the Bible tells us rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice mm -hmm. rejoice in the tribulations rejoice in your sufferings in Christ uh, he is present there for you. As a young boy, as a young man, the institutions I valued, that I admired, that I wanted to be part of, uh, the Episcopal Church, the FBI, the military, Wall Street firms, uh, my universities, all have shown themselves to be corrupt and decayed and broken. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ has never let me down. And I get, as the older I get, the more and more that I see of the truth of all that Paul said about this world and how we should make our joy and our hope and our trust in Christ and Christ alone. And Christ is not the church. Justin Welby doesn't worship Jesus Christ. He worships the church. Um, and, oh, well, I am happy because Christ is real and it, it, my salvation and he's brought me eternal life it's he hard to be a pep there. it's very difficult to be a pessimist in a Christian and uh, our countenance and our uh, reflections because and we've seen this before what happened in the Church of England is a reflection of what was happening in the Episcopal Church 18 years ago okay mm -hmm. we've seen it before we've seen it in the Church of Canada at some point uh, Leaders believe the zeitgeist of the day more than they believe in reason, tradition, and scripture, and that's what happens. Uh, Justin Welby is surprised at the reaction uh, from the Anglican Communion. He's surprised at the reaction from inside the Church of England. I'm not surprised. George, are you surprised? Not in the slightest. But Kevin, let me just take it from that big picture down to a very small picture. I visit nursing homes some some I visit every week and hold services, others I go as needed. Mm -hmm. And if for many people they walk into a place and, you know, I'm talking of the super elderly, 90s and 100 year olds, they're in a, a rather sterile, you know, we're not a wealthy area. There are no fountains in the courtyards here and uh, uh, valet parking and things. And you look in and you see such hopelessness. People are alone, they're sad, they're fighting illness and disease. And I go in with a smile in my heart because I know Christ loves each and every one of these. And I'm going to be the last minister they see on this earth. So I better darn well share the love and the joy of Jesus Christ and walk with them in their journeys. And yet, and I see again and again and again people even in the midst of major depressive disorder, have hope. And if you don't have hope, then I would despair. But I have hope. 
I have hope the Episcopal Church will turn around. I hope the Church of England will turn around. Mm -hmm. Before the last day. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 791 of Anglican Unscripted.